Hello, and welcome to Farming Matters, a video series from of the North Central Sustainable Egg Research and Education, or SARE program. I am Erin Schneider. I am a farmer and the administrative associate with the North Central Sustainable Egg Research and Education program. And I am here today with Marie Flanagan, a co-host of Farming Matters, and producer of the show. Hi, Marie. Hi. And I... <laughs> And I'm also here. We are very lucky to have Beth Neff with us. Beth um, wears many different hats, and one of them is a farmer, and she is here to share um, about her project. Um, and Beth, I will just let you take it from here. I know you have a lot of experiences to share from what's going on in St. Louis and where you've been. And after that, we'll get a chance to just, just highlight and celebrate the work you're doing on the ground in St. Louis. Okay, um, so welcome to the Marsh Cooperative. Our project um, was neighborhood-based cooperative market gardening in Carondelet, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, Carondelet is a severely disinvested uh, neighborhood in St. Louis. Um, our project was founded by a mother-daughter team, myself and my daughter, as a social arts performance project. So we um, established a team of collaborators, um, five of whom became board members um, with this, the idea of exploring ways in which food could become an organizing anchor for sustainable community development, democratic governance, and climate resilience. Um, so we did a lot of research around the city of St. Louis and finally found what we believe to be the perfect site for our project. Um, I used the proceeds from the sale of my farm in Indiana and we purchased this long vacant, a decade vacant pro multi-use property in Carondelet um, on a main artery in Carondelet. Uh, the property consisted of three upstairs apartments, um, a diner, a former diner, um, the inside of the diner, and just left as it had been for 40 years. <laughs> um, a big open space that had been a dining room for them and that we removed all of the remnants of that. Um, and very fortunately for us, a large vacant lot out back that we developed then into a labyrinth uh, permaculture garden. So we spent the first year and a half uh, renovating the building. Um, it was um, in very bad condition um, for both residency and for public space. And in early, uh, in 2018 and early 2019, we held a series of community meetings to try to figure out what, um, what types of building uses um, the neighborhood would respond to Everyone wanted the diner to be reopened. And so we developed the idea of creating a cooperatively managed diner and grocery. Then in the spring of 2019, um, our region was hit by severe Mississippi River flooding. Um, we're about a quarter mile from the Mississippi River here and we suffered um, extensive damage. Um, and that damage took us um, an entire year pretty much to recover. But during that time, we um, worked to develop an online platform for our grocery cooperative. We thought that would be maybe a good way to start. And so we built a website um, where people could purchase any products that we had access to directly for themselves um, and that we would divide it among the various members. Uh, this website is still operating. Um, and we launched the online food co-op exactly one week before the first COVID shutdown of 2020, so March 2020. Um, so for that period of time, we continued with exclusively online sales and curbside pickup, um, but the main efforts um, were based on the fact that we were inundated with a huge demand for mutual aid food supplies. And we devoted many hours and resources to filling that need. Um, we also made uh, sliding scale groceries that we acquired through the cooperative and from uh, our gardens and other local producers, um, made that available to the neighborhood by holding weekly um, outdoor markets. 
So several things um, became clear to us during this period. Um, the first was that we needed to make the fresh food we were growing and procuring from other vendors more widely available. Um, and one way to do that was to open a brick and mortar grocery store. Um, the second was that we needed to grow more food directly in the neighborhood um, because one of the primary things we were learning from our neighbors is that there was a severe shortage of fair wage jobs and sustainable food resources. And the third was that we wanted to involve more people in the process of producing that food through democratic collaboration. Um, so we were able to pursue the first objective of um, opening a brick and mortar store with a successful grant application to the Healthy Food Funding Initiative. Um, and we had also had extremely positive responses to organizing around the, the cooperative diner before flooding and COVID hit. Um, it generated a lot of interest, and so we thought, well, we can apply that same energy and concept to the network of community gardens, and that is what motivated the application to the um, to SARE for a grant to create a worker-owned urban farming cooperative that grows food for consumer co-op and the broader community. Um, we basically followed the process that we had outlined in the grant. Um, as we engaged in this process. So the first step was to engage the neighborhood in this project through a variety of events, you know, sort of test people's um, desire around and understanding of what community food production would look like, um, issues of food equity, fair employment, um, how we make decisions together. Um, and then the next step was to, um, so we sent out, we created an application, um, a number of events where people were invited to participate, combination of work days, meetings, sharing of food, um, just to get people um, involved and excited about what could happen. Um, you know, just a variety of different kinds of events, um, including, you know, outdoor barbecues, music, um, just anything to, to engage people in the process. Um, we were able then to build a team that was comprised primarily of non-binary and women identified people of color who described themselves through our application process as having personal experience with food insecurity, um, an interest in collaborative decision-making and were located in the neighborhood. Um, and so this group of people took on the task of developing, transforming a grassy, you know, just sort of vacant double lot into viable food production um, by doing the planning together, um, the planting together, setting up, um, preparing, and then learning how to um, market our produce. So um, we held a number of work days. We established the site with a combination of um, like, um, mulching techniques, uh, cardboard, newspaper. Um, we hauled in massive amounts of chips, uh, massive amounts of compost, and created uh, gardening beds to um, establish our new space. Um, so the planting began in the early spring of March 2021. Um, with our new team, um, some of whom were Spanish speakers, some of people who had no experience with gardening before, um, and um, worked through what collaborative decision-making processes would look like, um, and also what our relationship to the community would be through a neighborhood gardening process. So lots of conversation, um, <laughs> lots of work, and um, lots of food. So we, um, we had a successful garden, um, definitely weed issues involved in year one of a garden space that used to be a grassy lot. Um, we are in the second year of that and most of those issues have presently been mitigated. So 
our food production then was transformed into um, a way that people could access it, both through the grocery store, which opened in July of that year. Um, we continued to do the outdoor market, um, and we also continued to be involved in mutual aid um, food activities where um, food would just be gathered and um, sent out to people in, in bundles um, along with groceries. So this is our new grocery store and a display of some of the produce that we produced in our two gardens, the one here at Marsh uh, and the, at the new garden. We call it the Minnesota Garden because it's at 7200 Minnesota and, um, you know, building traffic. So I think that um, some of the questions you had asked was, um, you know, wh what kind of results, like what, um, what was our most impressive result? Um, and I would definitely say that um, the relationship that we're building in the community has been an important part of that. Um, we do um, produce a lot of prepared foods now, um, a combination of the produce that's produced, anything that's left over um, from the gardens and also we order from regional suppliers. And so anything that it, we, nothing goes to waste at large. <laughs> um, we just, everything gets transformed into some kind of a food product. So, um, you know, we all learn together how to make focaccia dough and um, we have our, you know, special products that people are excited about. Um, we have a lot of volunteer groups that come out to help in the garden. So we've made a lot of great connections and partnerships. Um, with other organizations um, who are interested in what's happening at Marsh. Um, college classes, um, you know, there's a, with every project, I think there's kind of a sur service level of, oh, this is what we're doing. And this, you know, is how it appears from the outside and what it looks like to the community. Um, but there's also sort of a deeper level of, you know, what, a, what you know, con a conceptual framework of um, degrowth and climate resilience and, um, post-capitalism and, you know, these, these issues um, give us a chance to be able to provide so many different access points for people just depending on where they're coming from and what they're most interested in. So um, this project has been uh, like tremendous in that regard. A um, little bit of media attention, it's always nice. So um, uh, newspaper, uh, television, um, yeah, it's been pretty cool response. Um, and then I wanted to just say that um, something that's really been important for us to learn, especially with a collaborative project like this one, is that everyone is going to come to this with a different set of priorities, a different focus, um, especially with a very complex project like this. Um, what are people most interested in? Um, some people were very focused on food production, learning farming skills. Um, you know, sort of the labor aspect of it, earning a good wage um, to, to work. Um, others were more interested in sort of the cooperative structures, you know, how do you make decision, decisions, um, how do you communicate in a group? Um, and the, the other very strong emphasis that came out of the particular group that we put together um, was outreach to food insecure patrons of the grocery store and the outdoor market and the development of the sliding scale model. So that, that is still a work in progress. We're always tweaking and changing, um, but the, the whole concept and the way that it would operate and the communication about it um, evolved out of this group process. So that, that felt um, really powerful. And also as a really um, important learning experience just to respond to the wide variety of needs and interests of the people involved and to be like nimble and flexible in our planning model. Um, and then you asked for advice. Um, <laughs> I was um, a little shaky, but I think the most important advice um, at this point in time, you know, just coming out of this process is to have some kind of an idea uh, plan for what comes next. You know, what are you going to do once the grant funds are gone um, or expended? Um, how will you keep the momentum going of a project that you started? Um, how will you ensure that the shared commitments that you've established in these relationships have a foundation for continuing and moving forward? Um, so I think 
that especially in um, relational economic situations, people that have become involved um, want to be part of next steps. And it's pretty essential to incorporate them into planning and to pursue strategies to access the resources to make those steps happen. One topic that comes up when people are talking about urban farming and, and um, SARE, soil quality and soil issues often come up as a concern. Can you talk at all about any of the soil quality or concerns you had working in an urban environment and testing you had to do? Um, that's an, another excellent question. I think there's a huge concern here about toxicity. Um, a lot of vacant lots are places where buildings existed before, and in some cases, the they were basically just pushed into a basement. So we have absolutely, you know, lead, arsenic, um, you know, there are a lot of coal burning at one point, There's, there is a lot of toxicity. Um, so um, we just built up as best we could. Um, we didn't want to expend a lot of resources. A lot of people do boxes, you know, like kind of that raised bed gardening. Um, we created a situation where we're just not really digging into the original soil at all. So we have added probably um, the newest gardens probably have like 12 to 18 inches of compost on top and the older spaces, um, like there's two feet of compost. So to me, you just brought up like one of the most important issues with both urban farming and, you know, what our sort of a climate response is going to be. Um, and that is where is the compost going to be coming from? How are we going to create enough compost if we're going to restore places that have been, you know, sorely poorly managed in the past? And we're also going to create like, um, you know, carbon <laughs> absorption, um, it's just going to create massive amounts of compost or ne the need for massive amounts of compost. And um, I've had this conversation also with other local agencies and organizations that are um, looking at that and water, like access to water as being um, pretty um, essential sort of like baseline issues to deal with as we move more into urban agriculture. I wanted to ask too, if you wanted to just share with our um, our listeners and viewers, like one another thread in there that came up with this uh, sliding scale or pay what you can model at the, cause it's sort of the theme there is co-ops helping co-ops, right? Or and community help, you know, neighbors helping neighbors. How, what did you notice or observe or however you want to respond to this or um, about how do you beat the, the farmers making, you know, what they a living wage from their produce sales and then also the work people in the grocery store and those who are able to pay what they can along the way and I just as a girl I'm like wow I'm so grateful you're addressing this head on and wow how do you even start yeah um kind of the answer to that is I have no idea <laughs> no it's it's um this is the uh, the primary economic challenge is you know to make transformation in what would be a fair and equitable economy in the middle of a totally extractive and exploitive economy. So um, it's a huge challenge, and we did start out allowing people to decide how much they were going to pay um, because of the neighborhood that we are in that was nothing for a lot of people. And um, we ended up giving away over $13,000 worth of product out of the grocery store um, and were you know, sort of threatening our viability with that model. So that's um, one of the reasons why I said, you know, we sort of tweak this to, um, we now, you can pay 20% below or 20% above and hopefully the balance comes in at cost. So everything in the store is priced at a very low markup, right around 12%, which we calculated is what it takes to cover, you know, basically keeping the lights on. Um, and, you know, the, the, the most basic um, economic priority. Um, one is that we operate as a not-for-profit. So that makes it so that we're not looking to extract any profit from the system, um, but we also need external funding. We need donations, we need grants, um, we need um, to be able to 
fund this from resources that come from outside of our existing system right now. So what, what do you feel like is transforming or growing out of this um, STAIR project into the um, next year? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a tremendous question. Um, I, um, so another SARE grant, <laughs> um, we did apply yeah. again. Um, and so we have a two-year grant now um, and to move this project um, to, you know, the center has been food. And I think that that still works um, for a framework, um, but to kind of have like the, the next ring be a climate resilience. Um, I think as we get more towards um, knowing our neighborhood, you know, sort of seeing kind of what we're up against in a lot of ways, not just us, but sort of like systemically, societally, um, th these are the people the precarious people are the ones who are going to be hurt first. Um, you know, we saw I included the slides of the flooding just because this is the kinds of things that we're going to be seeing more and more often. Um, you know, the heat with this summer. I mean, it's kind of amazing that we we are doing a SARE project to kind of figure out how we can respond specifically to growing challenges, but also to what kinds of like community and relational challenges they're going to be. Um, so that is where we're, we're headed with the focus of having like an actual like climate um, conference or symposium at the end of 2023. So about a little over a year from now. And you mentioned that wanting to make sure people had the energy to continue going and, and to that next step. Like where is your energy at right now? And what, what get, get, is most alive for you as heading into this next phase of your, um, this project in the year? Well, um, I will answer honestly that my energy is very low. Um, my expenditure of energy is extremely high. Um, and part of the reason for that, and I guess that's why <laughs> um, my most important advice was to plan for what comes next, um, particularly with the, um, the HFFI grant, which um, is a larger grant to get the grocery store open. Um, we had a large staff, and once the, 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 that process asked for, um, you know, budget projections out to five years, and those projections showed, you know, somewhat arbitrary, but they showed that we would be breaking even at five years, and that seems to be true. So what do we do then between years two and five? Um, and the answer is unfortunately that our, our team is much smaller than it was while we were being funded by the grant. Um, we have fewer hours in the store than we were able to fund during that period of time. So we have had to scale back and that is incredibly disappointing. Um, you know, we sort of lost um, the farm actually has been able to keep going, but, but in regards to the grocery store, um, we lost sort of some of that building of, of skills and interest and investment and that sort of thing um, to the point where it kind of feels like some of that is, is going to be starting over again. Um, so we were not necessarily, we have a couple of people who, um, you know, we have some continuity um, but what happens then is that the founders have to plug in because, you know, I'm a volunteer, um, I'm not pulling from any salary from what's happening. And so my hours are the only thing really in some ways that keep that going, you know, with the cooking and the gardening and the processing, um, and that sort of thing. And we also started a CSA this year, um, as a strategy to kind of save the grocery store. So um, we have that membership. Um, it's not on a sliding scale. You know, that's kind of our, the, the privileged people redistribution of wealth, basically supporting the rest of the system. Um, but that, you know, <laughs> I'm sure you know, is an exceedingly high amount of work. Um, so, you know, preparing those um, shares, you know, twice a week because we, people have two different pickups. Um, it's, it's a whole other activity really. Um, and we sort of tacked it on in hopes that we would be able to keep everything else going. Um, so it, yeah, things are, are, um, yeah, they're a little scary right now. I think what is there anything back that, um, you want to just 
that feels left unsaid in your heart or in your mind about the project or this experience or this moment or it's really wonderful and exciting that we have a, a way of publicly providing resources for um, exploring these really important questions of sustainable agriculture. And I think that Sarah has made a, a outsized contribution um, to positive research around sustainable agriculture to the actual just activity of people doing sustainable agriculture and also to the public just assuming that this is a baseline you know that this is how agriculture could and should be done um and sort of that that knowledge so i um i really just honestly <laughs> appreciate the funding and i also appreciate like what you guys are doing with this um, because I do think just the more we talk about it and the more it's out there, the more people have just an understanding that, this, wow, you, that you can do this. Like we can grow food like in our city or in our surrounding rural regions and that people um, that, you know, we can all contribute to what support for that looks like. So I've appreciated being in relationship with this, um, with Sarah as an institution for a long time and um, it's making even more of an impact now to what we're doing. Well, Beth, it's bouquets of gratitude and just really thank you for your time and much, much luck and, and success and good, good mojo to you and the, your neighborhood and the soil and all of it. And thank you so much. Yes, yeah. you are very, yeah, we'll look forward to crossing paths again. <laughs> <laughs>